Hello everyone, this is Ben from Urban Vinyl Daily, and this and I'm with Scribe for our weekly wrap-up. So Scribe, for those who don't know who you are and have been living under a rock, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Um, yes, I started off as an illustrator, um, worked my way into the graffiti world, and have been painting, like started out painting graffiti, and did have been doing like mural work for the past, 23, 25 years or so, um, was lucky enough through Cardboard Spaceship to get more involved in, like, the vinyl toy scene. Um, so I've been lucky enough to, like, work with Kid Robot. Um, Cardboard Spaceship in particular has allowed me to do, like, my more um, original work. And then um, most recently, um, I've been working with Andrews and McNeil, a publishing company, um, that it's actually based out of New York and Kansas City. And um, I've released my first chapter book, um, about 150 um, full-color illustrations and a full narrative story um, using my characters, um, in particular my rumpus character, the, uh, a rhino character. Um, and I'm also the art director for Children's Mercy Hospital out of Kansas City which has me traveling to, like, multiple locations. And so my quote-unquote 9 to 5 would be making murals for kids um, and patients and visitors to try to, like, help lower the, um, the anxiety of what a hospital visit would be like for someone. So that's, a, that's a good topic, the fact that you have a book out that we've talked about multiple times on this podcast and the blog. Would you mind telling the people... I guess, a little bit about the Scribble Squad and the, the Wild Weird West. Um, so when Andrews and McNeil approached me about possibly doing the book, one of the characters that they were interested in using was Rumpus, and, and it's the rhino character that I've been painting um, for the last 20 years or so on walls. But we wanted to sort of like rewind to um, the 12-year-old version of who Rumpus was. Um, so then we had to kind of create this like group of, we created this group of characters um, that would go on an adventure together and what were his 12-year-old friends like. And uh, so we have a, a tiger character named Ty, um, and then we have a set of twins that are both like groundhogs um, or prairie dogs, um, and one of them is named Phil, um, and the other one is named Flox. Um, the three main characters that do the painting um, are the the male character of Phil, of the groundhog or the prairie dog, uh, the tiger, and Rumpus. And Phlox is actually like a, a reporter for their school newspaper. So the story opens up with Rumpus's grandfather named Duncan owns a plumbing shop in Kansas City and has given these three 12-year-olds their first permission wall to do I guess, quote-unquote, street art or whatever it's called now. And um, they, they set out to do a mural. They have three pretty unique different outlooks on things. Um, and the only thing that uh, Rumpus's grandfather has asked him to do is to do a Wild West theme because he was really into old Western movies and, uh, and was interested in the Wild West. So... They set out to do a mural, but what ends up happening is they end up creating three separate outlooks on the same subject matter. Um, his grandfather comes out to uh, kind of help guide them, uh, you know, the way that a grandfather or a parent would, and uh, gives them some special paint to finish out the mural, and this special paint ends up creating a portal um, and the characters end up sort of pushing through the wall, and they end up in a world that's a combination of all the different outlooks and styles. Um, Phlox, who is the, the girl character and the reporter, ends up being kind of the brains behind the whole operation. But without giving away, like, the entire story, um, there's just multiple levels of, like, how the three characters end up having to, like, lean on their strength and lean on each other and work more as a group. Um, and also, in the process of doing that, they kind of help a town come together 
um, that's been separated. Um, it's a town that used to be artistic and known as sort of the jewel of the this part of the West. And um, some money people successfully separated the Na Native Americans of the area from the the settlers from the area. And uh, these characters end up helping these two groups get back together, um, which creates like another level of like a you know partnership and working together and getting over each other's differences. And then they basically go on a crazy adventure and work their way home. Um, people that know my murals um, probably know that most of them are pretty stupid. I guess is the way that I describe it all the time. Uh, I mean, but all jokes aside, they're kind of like fantasy based with like giant flying catfish and weird people, characters riding giant hamsters and stuff. And uh, Andrews and McNeil was really awesome about allowing me to bring a lot of that humor and a lot of that different outlook into my book. And a lot of these murals that I do incorporate a lot of my friends, um, like graffiti lettering from DF and ATT crew in particular. Um, so they were really great about like allowing me to sprinkle my friend's graffiti lettering throughout the book. I was and just I about to ask that since that's a theme that I've noticed in The Octopus Under the Bed and I was about to ask about your real life friends, about how many the adults should look for that are peppered throughout the book for your friend's letterings. Um, I mean, there's, are you asking like a, um, you know, like what, what particular people? Um, just for, for the adults reading the books to their kids who also have or know of the theme from the, octop the octopus under the bed, who is, which is peppered with um, uh, several of your friends. How many artists should people be on the lookout for to be hidden in the book? Oh, man, it put me on the spot. I can't remember how many. I'd say that there's at least six or seven lettering guys that are in there. Um, I can name East and Emit and Jive. Um, all these guys live in Denver. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine gave me some Costa pieces, and he's from uh, Cincinnati. And my friend Sub, who lives in the New York area, um, and my buddy Taste, um, who also is in the Denver area. And all these guys are like, um, in particular right now, are all um, they're all crewmates, and uh, I like to incorporate that stuff in there because uh, I didn't get a chance to finish art school, and I didn't get a chance to finish college, and to truthfully, being around these guys and being around these crewmates is a major part of my, my education, um, a major part of my influence, even though that they, a lot of them do something that is extremely different than what I do. Um, their aesthetics, their color sense, their, um, you know, like laying out walls with them and talking about ideas is a lot of what ends up motivating me and it ended up being part of my education. So part of the reason why I like to, in, like, infuse that stuff in there is uh, basically to, you know, to thank these people that have been a big part of my life, but also to kind of, like, give people a glimpse into, like, how I see things, like I, I see a lot of my artwork accompanied with their lettering. I see graffiti lettering around the city, um, and I love seeing that interwoven with all the buildings and stuff uh, around any city that I go to, and that's like I see it as an intricate part of any urban setting, so I like to in, like put it in there. Um, the, the goal is to try to figure out how to do some of that stuff and make my best effort at doing it with some integrity, mm -hmm. um, but not doing it to where I'm like, I'm not, I'm making my best effort to not try to like sell graffiti or Disney-fy it or anything like that, but, you know, just make sure that people know that that was a, um, that was and is a big part of my history and who I am. And um, it, lo it looks of, like in the book, and with everything that as you thank everyone who supported and helped you along the way. But at least there seems to be a photo campaign on your Facebook and around of people who are really, really enjoying the book, kids in particular, and it looks like adults too who are, who are posting the Facebook photos. Um, 
I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm ecstatic to hear that because this whole project has been like a two-year thing in the making. We actually, re, we did an entire book almost, and then it's a really long story. But um, I mean, I work on overarching ideas um, and stuff, and then like I end up working with a, a writer that helps like refine that down into you know the uh, dialogues between characters and stuff, which. I'm not as uh, gifted at, um, but my illustrations, like, they influence me to a certain degree, and I work on illustrations, and then my illustrations, if I decide that I want to add something in there, it ends up influencing the uh, some of the writer people that I worked with um, in order to make specific changes. So I was, I was in control, um, but my, my goal, like, whenever I end up doing my gallery shows, um, and when I do my walls is like um, crossing generations is something that's really important to me and also like figuring out ways to combine generations to make something that people end up sharing together. Um, you know, and earlier I was talking about like I wouldn't want to Disneyfy something, but that was actually something that whether you like the politics of like what the Disney Corporation is early Disney and what he was about and the films and stuff that he made made a real effort to sort of make something that crossed generations and that left an imprint on me. Um, I have a different set of things that I'm into but that, that core value of making something that an adult can enjoy on one level you know, at a gallery show but feel comfortable about bringing their kid to is something that's really important to me. So I'm not as stressed out about making like an exact um, point or trying to be, you know, like conceptually born, you know, hitting somebody over the head with something. Um, I can just put a simple title, do a certain, you know, like amount of illustration work that leans that direction. But like a parent can come in there with their kid. Um, it doesn't have to be hokey and kitty looking, um, but it can be something that uh, they can kind of share together on multiple levels. And I hope that the book, like, ends up kind of transferring the other direction, that, like, a parent reads that and kind of, like, remembers what it's like to be imaginative and silly um, and enjoy that with their kids. So it's been awesome to see the, the feedback that I've been getting so far. Of course. It's, it's a good book from what I can tell from the pictures and what you and I have talked about. So... How was the uh, the book release this past weekend? Oh, uh, it was insane. Um, I have to honestly, like every time I walk into a show, I I kind of have to like I'm constantly convincing myself that nobody's going to come, but it doesn't mean that it's not a success. It's just that like sometimes outside circumstances prevent people from being able to come out and support. Um, and to not get hung up on numbers, to not get hung up on sales that, like, that has nothing to do with the quality of the, proje the project. Um, I'm constantly blown in a way, blown away and amazed by the people that show up, the amount of support they do, and uh, it was an insane night because um, because of the crowd that came in and because of how many people came to show up and support, like. I signed, personalized, and drew a sketch in every single cover of that book for four and a half, five hours straight um, because it was so amazing to me that people were, one, willing to wait and willing to like take time out of their lives to, to come out and even support what I was doing. So it was a major blessing. And then it looks like this past weekend's was so popular that you have a second one on September 10th. Um, we were doing, um, that one was already in the works and it's over, so I live on the Kansas City, Missouri side. Um, for those that don't know, Kansas City um, actually has like two separate downtowns. Um, on the Kansas side, um, I, I mean, I live literally live blocks away from the state line. Um, and so this other one is out in Kansas, and it hits, like, a different crowd. Honestly, it's, like, a little bit more of, a, like, a suburban crowd. Um, but it's out at this place called Prairie Fire. 
um, and the the people that are hosting it are called Fat Brain Toys, and they they like they're a company out of Omaha that like really focuses on toys that challenges um, you know like kids' intellectual skills, and it's not just about video games and stuff. So they're hosting the event, but this place called Prairie Fire is a small development that has like it's kind of like that outdoor mall you know concept. But the people that own it and developed it have been a huge support of both me and my wife. Um, Elisa has a bunch of stuff in a place called the Threshing Bee out there. Um, my large murals, I don't know if you ever saw it with the like giant dinosaur running and rumpus is in there and um, uh, there's a giant like rabbit riding a horse and like setting the prairie on fire to sort of like rejuvenate the land and so on like They've been amazing about, like, just kind of giving me a couple key words but not, like, overly directing me. And for a place out there that, like, I went out there feeling tense and thinking, honestly, that, like, this suburban culture would be controlling and say, like, we want you to do this, uh, this you know, like, your artwork, but this version that we tell you to do, they were the complete opposite. And they just let me do whatever I want. And I would just text them and say, I'm doing flying fish and, like, weird stuff. And they were like, that's great. Just be you. Um, so they were a pleasure to work with. And when they helped me hook up with Fat Brain Toys, like, it just seemed like a good fit because this company is second to, uh, I think, Toys R Us in toy sales in the country. But it's all, like, real intellectual um, and stuff that, like, challenges kids to think more. Um, so I'm excited. I'm going to do a live painting event out there, um, sign some books, and hopefully hit like another part of Kansas City that wasn't able to come into the the whole gallery show event. And so, for for those who weren't able to attend the show, there was also a vinyl soundtrack that went with that that comes with the download code code if for those that don't have a record player. So uh -huh. how how did that soundtrack come together to kind of em embody Rumpus overall and that the book and the comic that comes with it? Okay, so well, so the, the children's book is sort of the 12-year-old version of Rumpus. Um, the album, um, I would say, is like the more adult version of him and probably the, the, the characters or the like embodies more of like what I've done in gallery shows. Um, uh, you know, I've been lucky enough to show at like Gallery 1988 and Stranger Factory and stuff, and Rumpus has been always ended up being in a bunch of pieces, but it's a lot more conceptual, a lot more, um, I guess, adult theme, and a lot of that ends up having to do with me and my experiences. And in, in a huge way, Rumpus is me, um, but he's kind of grown into being this, like, I'm telling the story of this creative uh, soul and, like, the heart of a creative that's, you know, making his best effort towards going uh, towards his dreams. But a friend of mine named Rich Lester, who also goes by Joker70, me and him did a comic together about the resound fields, which is a place that Rumpus gets transported to um, that has all these crazy cup cupcakes that tempt people and that's where the bumblebees are that like are also like represent peer pressure and it and I started making an effort to I guess connect the dots between my murals and my paintings and start explaining some of the conceptual aspects and like what's happening in between one painting to a, a mural and so on. Um, but music has always been a huge part of my life. I I almost made uh, I almost went to music school instead of art school. Um, so I have a huge heart for like hip hop and DJs and, um, you know, like acid jazz and jazz music. Um, so I hooked up with this producer, Joker 70, and we made a comic book about Rumpus getting transferred or, or uh, transported to the resound fields and released it with a CD. I think we only did a hundred copies of that and that sold out several years ago. Um, we sat down and started talking about doing it again, and uh, he brought in another music producer named Tristyle, who's worked with a whole bunch of different people. Um, he actually did a track that came with the, the white rumpus 
that was released with Cardboard Spaceship at SDCC. Um, and uh, each, each one of the toys released ends up coming with a download code. And you can get, uh, you know, like different songs off of there. But anyway, um, we started working on this album, and I just gave them a really loose, uh, like, outline of, like, this is what Rumpus is doing or feeling. Uh, Rumpus falls in love with an otter. Like, how would you, um, how would you interpret that? And I told them that I, and rather than me drawing a comic and, and Rich making a soundtrack to it, which is how we did the first one, I, w I wanted to be influenced by what they did. So on a loose outline, they made whatever they wanted. I gave them freedom. I pulled in a whole bunch of different other artists, hip-hop artists, um, um, people that did all different styles of music, and we basically made a movie soundtrack. And then I sat down and started drawing comics to it. So the album comes with um, a limited edition comic book um, that uh, describes each one of the tracks. Some of them it's just a spread in the book. Other ones it's like a seven-page comic. Depending on how it hit me and influenced me is how I, I let it guide me on my drawing um, stuff. So personally, I think they nailed it uh, between... Chris Style and, and Joker 70 and this other guy uh, named Icy Rock, uh, those three guys did a whole bunch of production work. They, they made something that I, I'm particular and really proud of and honestly past the comic. Um, I, I see this as a almost like as a movie soundtrack because it's it's pretty genreless. I mean there's two there's two tracks on there that are obviously hip hop and there's like real positive guys that MC on there, a guy named Joe Good and another old group named The Basement Chemist um, who have worked with DJ Spinner and some different people out of New York. Um, but they, uh, other than that, the rest of it kind of goes in a bunch of different directions. Um, and so you can go on Bandcamp and look up Catch-22 um, or Rumpus in these horns of mine and uh, you'll be able to preview the album um, possibly pick up the album, or there's a digital download version of it. But, uh, the digital download version of it does not come with the comic. And if I remember right, uh, the the book the book opening featured the last colorway of the cardboard spaceship rumpus. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, we released kind of like I mean, I jokingly called it the monochromatic, like black on dark gray, artsy mono mono one um and there's a guy uh here locally named barrel maker who's been kind of making waves in some of the like underground uh rap uh world uh but he wrote a beautiful track specifically about rumpus and the red backpack that he wears um so it comes with a digital download of that as well so we released that early um here in kansas city so that um the people that have supported me locally for so long had early access to it. Um, I, I believe um, I could be saying this wrong, and it wouldn't wouldn't be the first time. But I think that Jamie and Nick from Cardboard Spaceship had plans for like decon range um, for maybe releasing the black one. Um, if they don't end up participating at decon, then they'll probably do some kind of online release or something planned later. But for now, um, I was able to purchase some, and I had my artist proofs and stuff, and we released them just um, just here in town for now. Speaking of decon and events in general, I know you have the two book releases in Kansas City. Can people who are not in Kansas City expect to see you anywhere around the country in the coming months? Um, I'm I'm working hard on it. I can't say that I'm definitely going to be anywhere um, right now. Um, having decon and all that stuff so close to Thanksgiving and me doing some traveling with family, um, it, it's hard, man. I'm, I'm really torn because I want to be in those places, but being a family man, you know, having my my quote-unquote nine-to-five at the at Children's Mercy Hospital and stuff, it's a lot of different things to, to juggle. 
um, and to try to figure out. And unfortunately, like it used to be that I'd be able to plan stuff out far enough in advance and I knew exactly what I was doing. And right now, it, just because of how many different things I'm juggling, I just have to sometimes like wait for the cards to fall into the right place. And if the money, you know, for me getting out there ends up working out and it doesn't affect my family, you know, like in a way where they're sacrificing too much just to get me to go out and play for a minute, um, then I go. Um, but at this point, I can't, I can't give a definitive answer, but I really want to. I feel like I've been removed from uh, some of that stuff for too long. Yeah, we, we understand it. Travis and I are going out as interviewers this year. We're dumping the booth idea for, I think, the first time. So yeah. we're going to see how that works out for us. I think, I mean, I, I think it's an awesome idea, and, and it may be, like, give you a different perspective on on how to do it in the physical next time, you know, mm -hmm. to, like, kind of take a, a break and be a spectator in an interview for a while. So I think that's an awesome idea that you guys are doing that. Um, I, you know, like living in the middle of the Midwest has its, like, blessings because it kind of, like, keeps me focused and I don't get, like, sucked up into, you know, other parts of the scene and stuff that I feel like could happen in other places. Uh, but at the same time, like, um, you know, being that family guy and just trying to make sure that their needs are always put ahead of mine, I have to make tough choices um, to sometimes not not participate um, in things. So I got a really nice invite from the guys from Silent Stage to come out and and possibly share some space with them. And now that the book is out, I feel like I have something physical that I can take with me even if I don't get the chance to like have some kind of like resin release or something and pull all that together. Then I can do something. Uh, but I, I, I just don't know yet. But I definitely want to. Uh, I really want to do New York Comic Con. Yeah, we, we've been there once, and it was it was pretty fun to go as a spectator for us. Yeah, there's I mean there's a kind of a crossover for me. Like for me, like I've never done New York Comic Con. It would be an awesome bucket list to be able to check out and see a different scene and see like what the similarities are and like what the differences are. And then the other side of me has like made some new friends over in the New York area. It's a little bit more connected into the graffiti scene and like being able to paint in New York um, and actually meet some, some people is uh, something that like I, I want to be able to take advantage of. But it's kind of the same thing as like running west, like I have to decide like what, um, what I can, what I can do and what I, what I can afford to do. You know, like taking this much time off to, to basically like focus in so much on the book uh, for the last couple of years kind of like removed me and it made it to where I couldn't do as many customs and that was like one of the ways that I could afford to go do stuff. But when you're working on a book and that's where 100% of the, your time is getting dumped into after you go to work, it doesn't really leave a lot of extra time to like try to make releases um, in order to help fund your ideas of being able to go other places. And then unfortunately it can almost become kind of a nasty cycle because then when you're not doing that, the longer you're away in some ways, uh, the easier it is for people to forget about you. <laughs> so, um, no one's you know, forgotten kinda, about you. So uh, I, I, I'd be lucky if that's, uh, if that's the case. I, I, I honestly, like, it's, it's hard for me to, to be missing. I mean, I, I got to go to San Diego Comic-Con uh, this year and got a chance to hang out with my buddies at Cardboard Spaceship, which was awesome. It was a whirlwind trip because I think I was on airplanes longer than I was in San Diego uh, because of a bunch of, I think, all that hacking stuff that happened with the airport. But um, I'm glad I got a chance to get there. I got to like shake different people's hands that I hadn't seen in a couple years, and that was that was fresh. Um, but it wasn't long enough. And uh, after doing the the big like San Diego Comic Con thing, like I was kind of torn. Like I was like, I don't know, this doesn't feel quite as homey as like Decon did, 
and I hear good things about the one in New York. Um, and so I was glad I got a chance to go and reconnect and basically pop my head up out of the hole and be like, I'm still alive. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. Hopefully I didn't make a bad choice and put my eggs in that basket and it created this situation where I can't travel other places. But I think I'm refocusing and if the, if the book takes off in a good way and sort of can like manage itself, it may free me up to like, start sculpting again and like get some stuff cast which is really a direction that I would like to like I'd like to be able to sort of float in and out of that like get back to it for a little bit and then like focus hopefully on another book and then get back into it so, you know if you need more see. stuff it's just going to fill up my bookcase <laughs> we will see man I my big push right now is actually not only getting people to pick up the scribble squad book uh, because Truthfully, I think it's a good story. Um, I think it's really unique as far as chapter books go with kids um, and touches on some like more like current issues and stuff that are going on. Um, I would love the chance to tell like another narrative. So I'm pushing on it for selfish reasons because I would love to do another book. It's not like some major money maker, um, but it's definitely it could grow into something that could be beneficial for me and, and be helpful for me and my family. Mm -hmm. But the other reason why I'm asking people to pick up the book is to possibly mail them in or even buy them on Amazon and send them directly to Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. I was about um, to figure out a way to get you to plug the donation aspect of the book. So I'm trying to basically close a loop. Um, the, there are a lot of kids. I've been painting at Children's Mercy now for 14 years, and honestly, I've made a major dent on that place, and it's become something where people people know the work. They know the work outside of the hospital from the murals around town, luckily. And then there's this whole generation of people my age that are having kids, and they're going to Children's Mercy for the best care in the nation. Um, and stuff, but then they're also seeing like a really creative atmosphere where this hospital has been incredible about letting me like be a partner with them and helping make this space uh, or this entire hospital and multiple clinics around the area um, into something that's a little bit more fun and lowers the anxiety. That being said, like they see the same style of artwork all over the hospital, whether it be a treatment room or on, um, you know, like any kind of like branding stuff that they do, or if they go into major waiting rooms or, or even now like into like big hallways and stuff. Uh, but the style is recognizable and I'm really lucky for that. Now the book um, gives them something to do. Some of these kids can't leave their room for long periods of time. They may see something going from point A to point B. Let's say they're going from radiology to a clinic to talk to a specialist. But some of them end up spending like um, too long, you know, in a in a room uh, in seclusion. And but they see the style and they understand that it's part of mercy. I'm just asking people to like go on Amazon. It's like eight, but it's under eight dollars right now on Amazon. And if they bought that and if they looked up Children's Mercy, which it's actually 2401 Gillum Road, Kansas City MO, 64108, and just put attention, volunteer services, that book would end up in the hands of somebody and then they would transfer that book to one of our young people in the right age group for free up on into the floor. And, and I think that for $8, they could end up making like a connection for kids where they can read a narrative about characters that are already surrounding them. Now they can read a story about something that's really similar and it'll give them something to do. And if you could like actually help change the experience of a kid um, that's in the hospital, a free gift shows up and it's a cool story and it takes them to a different place for a while just like a mural should do all for under $10. Like that's crazy. And for um, most adults, so, that's a trip to Chipotle or two Starbucks yeah. runs. What's that? It's an or uh, trip to Chipotle or two Starbucks runs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Oh, totally. Yeah, four. Yeah, my dad calls it four bucks. 
um, because that's about what everything costs. But yeah, you're right. You know, it's like you just pull back for um, a couple of like one of your luxury things, and you could send something in. And Children's Mercy is a place that serves kids who don't have the money to to do it. So they're they're a non for profit, and they're a whole lot like St. Jude. So if a kid comes in and they can't pay. They figure this out for these kids. That's why this place is so fresh. Um, and to be able to like be a part of that, like you're not just feeding like some corporation or anything like that. You're you're like feeding kids and feeding a place that has a genuine heart for like helping heal people. Um, and like you could participate in a small way. A lot of people get really caught up and they end up like people that may be from our generation that are or. In, within certain tax brackets that think that, like, there's no way that I can do anything to help. Um, well, this is, a, to me, this is a $10 help that could help, that, that can directly end up helping the kid. You know, they think, like, what is $50 going to do to a hospital that, like, costs, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to run a day, probably, because of the amount of employees? And that's true. That is, like, overwhelming. But this is a cool way to, like, be able to, donate something and know that it's going to land in the hands of a kid. And, that's, and is, is that fairly streamlined through Amazon or does whomever buy the book need to put the address in and send it as a gift like you would do? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so, I mean, if they bought it on Amazon and if they look up Children's Mercy Hospital, comma, Kansas City, and you'll be able to find the address and you put attention volunteer services, then that book will end up in end up in the hands of a kid. I guarantee it. Okay, and we'll make sure to put that up on the video too for anyone who may need some instructions or just to see the address written out. That's awesome. Thank you very much. And so, as as we've taken up a lot of your time, is there anything else you want to say about the book or just in general to impart wisdom? Um. Really just like thank you for anybody that's been following my silly artwork for this, this long and like has been willing to pick up the story and be able to see something that's a little bit more in depth. Thank you to the people that have already picked up the album and supported the project because you're also supporting some friends of mine that I really believe in um, that, that deserve more out of life than like what they're currently getting and chipping away at it. So you buy that album and you're supporting me, then you're, you're also supporting an extension of myself um, and some of my favorite people in the world. Um, the fact that anybody is still following my stuff on Instagram and uh, Facebook um, and my website and the people that have also been like so supportive of my, of my wife, I, I really can't thank you enough because it's been motivating me to be a better version um, of myself. Uh, not only artistically, but just in the types of things that we're delivering to people as an experience. So, um, thank you for to everybody that's ever, um, you know, like spent a, a dollar or, or way more on, on any of the silly ideas I put out there. So, I appreciate it. So, as far as a website or social media, where can people find your work? Um, it's pretty similar. So it's, a, I mean, like scribeswalk.com is my, my website, which I'm really bad at updating. Uh, but scribeswalk across the board on social media stuff um, is the, the best way to find me on Instagram. And um, I think I barely use Snapchat. And then like uh, and Twitter are the, are the two main ones. On Facebook, if you just look up Donald Ross Scribe, my artist page will um, pop up, and that's a great way to follow my more personal posts um, and stuff. But uh, those are the major ones uh, right there. Are there any records left over that people might be able to find online, or do they sell out? Um, so those are available on Bandcamp right now. And so if you went to Bandcamp, um, I hope I'm not saying this right. I think that the way Bandcamp works is you can search it out. But if you look up catch, uh, C A T C H 22 or rumpus in these horns of mine, then you should be able to track down the album and still be able to get the album with the comic. And I think the digital download allows you to download it yourself and maybe share that code with one more person and, and give, 
uh, that album to somebody. Um, every record is different, like they're not traditional black records. Every, every one that you open, kind of like the toy concept, is a totally different color and mixture than the next one. So uh, we kind of tried to make the, the comic sort of like a print. Uh, but it's a very limited run. Uh, there's only a couple hundred records out there uh, floating around. Um, so I, I suggest picking one up before they disappear. Definitely. Or if you don't have a record player, buying one of those too. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, like if they if they don't have a record player um, and they still want it, like uh, people pay a lot more money for a print. This is basically a twelve and a quarter by twelve and a quarter, really awesome print that you can throw on a record frame, still be able to get the music, be holding on to a collect what I hopefully will become uh, a, a collector's item, and then also be able to get this comic that um, is a, a limited edition thing too. If your octopus under the bed book is then the indication of the popularity, I'm sure these will sell pretty quickly. And I hope sell. so. I mean, I hope so. And I, I think that this one will move a little bit slower than, than the other book because the challenge is, is that records are something that like, is, is really unique uh, to people. But I think if you look at it like a print and look at it like, um, like an investment and stuff, I think that you'll still be able to get the music. You can still display the artwork as an art piece. Um, I mean, those record frames from Ikea are a great way to, to display it. But um, so I'm or hoping, Michaels, that, if you don't I'm hoping have that people enjoy it. And I, and I think that the music really, too, like hits a lot of different genres and stuff. I think that people will be surprised um, at, at the kind of music that it's like and how they all play together, uh, almost like a movie soundtrack. Yeah. Thanks for uh, taking some time out of your busy work schedule with all with uh, with the book release and the preparation for the next book or the next event on the tenth. So, uh, and I can't thank you. I thank you, and I can't thank you guys enough for for like blogging about my stuff. And you know, like I'm kind of on and off sometimes. Like I'll be really attentive and like talk. And sometimes I end up doing disappearing acts, and it's never anything personal. I just. Uh, I struggle with juggling all these things and wearing all the different hats and being like the point of contact and keeping my head down and working and stuff. So thanks for being patient with me on the times where I'm less communicative. And thank you for continuing to support my work by um, putting any of that stuff out there uh, for the public to see. So no I problem. It's easy to, easy to promote good work. Oh, thank you. I hope you guys have a good night, man. You too, and thanks for everyone for tuning in and listening to Scribe and us talk about his newest book and the endeavors associated with it. Hey everyone, this is Travis Likens from Token Nerd Podcast, and I'm here today to tell you something about sponsorship. That's right. Token Nerd now has a sponsor. The fine folks at TenaciousToys.com, your source for designer toys, pop vinyl, original art, and more, are now our sponsor. And guess what? As a part of that, you can get 10% off your next order at TenaciousToys.com by entering the code TOKEN10 at checkout. That's right, 10% off. And not only are they giving you this code, they're also going to be sponsoring many of our Token Nerd giveaways in the next coming months. So make sure to follow us at token underscore nerd on Instagram to catch our latest giveaways.